Okay. So last time we were talking about infection dynamics in, uh, in epidemiological models, um, which is very topical. Today, we are moving into thinking about modeling the dynamics and growth of the diffusion of ideas through people. And we will see that it inherits a great deal from thinking about things like infectious diseases. So there will actually be a lot of overlap with, uh, with last time, not because of uh, you know, any medical reasons or anything like that, but because the dynamics just happen to be similar. So uh, you know, getting to dynamics, like so we skipped over chapter five, but in chapter five, Moorcroft talked about how modeling is an iterative learning process. And so um, this uh, idea here is that you start with a dynamic hypothesis, that um, allows you to sort of um, start, you, you know, once you've articulated the problem of interest, then you kind of start thinking about what are ways in which I can explain what's going on in that system. And then you start sketching out your feedback loops and so on and so forth, so that you can start testing your hypothesis. And so um, some ways of forming your dynamic hypothesis make these dynamic modes of behavior more obvious. And so we've already learned about certain types of modes of behavior here. So we've, uh, you know, we've seen this like um, S-shaped growth curve show up quite a bit. And so the, you end up seeing S-shaped growth pop up into a lot of models, but some models make it more obvious that there's S-shaped growth than others. And so we're going to sort of talk about ways in which we build these models so that these dynamic hypotheses are more clear when you're just looking at these diagrams. So we see a bunch of examples of real S-shaped growth so here's an example of real data for uh, growth of sunflowers. And so you see that over a time of progression here, the height of a sunflower uh, grows until eventually saturates out. We also see S-shaped growth in markets like US uh, cable television subscribers. And so initially it grows kind of slowly, it picks up, it grows quickly, and then you can start seeing there's an inflection point and it starts rounding out. It's sort of, uh, you can imagine there's like a maximum number of people who would ever adopt cable and you get closer and closer to that point. And then uh, you can also see it in adoption of other technologies like pacemakers, for example. So uh, this is actually how many physicians are prescribing these pacemakers. And so you can see that it's kind of a slow adoption and then something happens, it picks up quickly, and then it rounds out. And in both of the, the curves on the bottom left and the bottom right, you know it has to saturate out because it stops at 100%. You can't go more than 100%. So eventually this growth has to stop. So you know that S-shaped growth will happen in these and they'll probably happen in a lot of examples of things where people are adopting things but there's a fixed number of people to adopt them. Now we've seen S-shaped growth before in the fisheries case that we've seen back in what chapter one and chapter two uh, where that also had this case where you can see fish uh, grow until they reach some inflection point and then eventually you reach a carrying capacity. And so um, I've shown two causal loop diagrams here beneath this S-shaped growth curve that are, are both have the exact same dynamics, although slightly different words associated with the variables. And so on the right one, we see a kind of a concrete example of the way you'd have a growth engine where sales, let's say of a particular, let's say an iPhone or, or a pacemaker, you know, they will have a certain growth engine that powers their growth. But then there's ultimately a limiting effect driven by market saturation, saturation that ends up ultimately limiting that sales rate so, so it can't climb, you know, trees can't grow to the sky. And then more generally, on the left-hand side of things, we, we generally, whenever we see this S-shaped growth, we have a, a generic growth engine kind of driving everything. But then ultimately, when things get so big, then there's a limiting factor which comes back in. And there's some carrying capacity that somehow is a parameter that determines when that limiting effect kicks in. So ideally, whenever we have S-shaped growth in a system, we would like to draw that system out so it's clear to find these reinforcing loops and these balancing loops. Because once we can identify those and have them drawn out, then it'll be easy to kind of see that we might have these limiting processes going on. But the problem is there's a bunch of different ways to draw these models. And so although I'd like to have something that looks like the upper left, 
In the case of the fisheries example, back from chapter one, I have the thing that's on the right here. And this thing looks like it has a single feedback loop. And it's not clear from that single feedback loop, where is the reinforcing loop? Where is the balancing loop? How does this whole S-shaped growth thing even work? Now, we know that if we look in this net regeneration lookup table, we see the lookup table on the bottom left here. And the claim is that this uh, upper, this positively sloped part of the lookup table is the reinforcing part. And the negatively sloped part is the balancing part. And that that and somehow those two contribute together to give you this S-shaped growth curve. But it's not very convincing. It's not very compelling to have these tied up into this funny lookup table. It really would be nice if we could somehow find a way to modify this diagram to separate out these two processes. So how might we do that for the fisheries case? Well, if we look at some of the formulas in here, then we can say, you know, there are other ways we could have wired this up. So this fish density down here, um, so initially when I calculated fish density, there was just sort of a total population. Well, if I instead, so I'll go back one slide, if instead of thinking of my fish as having a total population that comes into the fish density as a parameter, as it's coming in through down here, this maximum fishery size, then the thought is that rather than limiting my fish growth through this parameter that's set out here, what if I created a separate stock of potential fish? So basically it would be like the total amount of fish I could possibly have would be however many fish I currently have plus however many fish I could possibly have in addition to the ones I currently have. And in order to calculate fish density, I just route in the potential fish into the fish density and the current fish into the fish density. And then to calculate fish density, I use a formula like the one down here, which is just the current number of fish divided by the two, the sum of the two, the current number of fish plus the number of potential fish. This is an alternate way of modeling carrying capacity where the number of potential fish is like a population that is gradually being converted from one side to the other. And if we look back into classes like SOS 101, where you might have talked about logistic growth processes and things, you might remember certain formulas that were used to that uh, kind of calculus based that represent these, these logistic growth curves. And you might remember uh, this formula up here, this top orange formula, where if X is the number of fish, and then R is kind of the growth rate of the fish, then you find that each fish has a certain kind of intrinsic growth rate, but it ultimately gets limited by this carrying capacity K. And so we had this formula that's kind of the standard logistic growth formula, which uh, with a little algebraic manipulation, we can turn into the formula on the bottom down here. So you can uh, you notice that K divided by K gives you a one. You notice then it leaves you with an X over K over here. And then you notice this Rx could be turned into an Rk divided by K times X. And the reason I've done this little manipulation is I've shown here that the formulas that you may have seen before that characterize logistic growth can be written in terms of density. So X divided by K, where K is the total carrying capacity of the fishery, that shows up in the bottom here. And so the current number of fish divided by K is the current density in the fishery. And so this density, well, that is already something that I had in my, uh, my model already. So I can route in my current fish stock and the remaining number of fish and be able to calculate fish density and run that into this formula instead of a lookup table. Because if I plot this formula where I plot density on the x-axis and this formula on the y-axis, then I get that hump-shaped curve that I originally had as a lookup table. So reformulating this way allows me to write a lookup table, which is sort of arbitrarily drawn, in terms of a formula. And that formula helps us better understand the underlying structure of how things are working. What does fish, um, I see, why does fish density depend on potential fish? So uh, the potential fish stock was another way for me to introduce the carrying capacity. So I've listed potential fish as K minus X. 
So if K is a carrying capacity, so I could just say in this particular fishery, we cannot support more than 100 fish. And so if I already have five fish in the, the fishery, then there's 95 fish that I could have left over. And so rather than me actually having this K as a real parameter, which it used to be a parameter hanging out as a separate dynamic variable here, then instead I'm reformulating this as instead of what's the total number, it's reformulated as how many spots are left over for new fish to be generated. So if I were to go back a couple of slides to the original formulation, which is back here, then I had a separate parameter that was a constant that I just slotted in here and the fish kind of came out of nowhere. They were not limited. They were, um, the limitation was a parameter that came in here. But now I'm instead, I'm implementing this differently as a, um, and I jumped too far ahead there, I'm implementing this differently as a stock of new fish that are possible to be generated. So this is an identical formulation, but I don't have that carrying capacity um, parameter in there anymore. I have just two stocks. So it's like before I needed one stock in a parameter, carrying capacity. Now I've gotten rid of carrying capacity and instead implemented two stocks, a fish that are currently here and a number of fish that could be born. Does that answer your question? And, and so because of that, in order for me to, your question is why does density depend on potential fish? In order for me to calculate potential fit or density, I need the total number of fish that are possible. So basically I see um, potential fish plus fish stock equals maximum capacity. That is exactly right. The, at any instant of time, the potential fish plus the fish stock is the carrying capacity. And and no matter how many potential fish and fish stock I have, the carrying capacity is going to stay constant. So I've taken what used to be a parameter and I've divided it up between these two stocks. And so in order for me to get that parameter back, I have to add those two stocks together. So the denominator in fish density used to be just the total number of possible fish. Um, and now it's the current fish plus the potential fish. So Alexandra, does that help answer your question? Yeah, that helps. So fish density is like the percent of fish that exist out of the total possibility of fish existing in the system? Exactly. You've said it just right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And so this whole exercise here was just to allow me to now illustrate that there really are two feedback loops here. There's a feedback loop from the fish stock going into fish density, driving what looks to be growth. And then there's a feedback loop that is depleting fish density um, or depleting new fish per year through the potential fish decreasing. And so um, that, this formula sort of makes that clear, but drawing it out this way, showing that I have these two loops, and then asking what happens as x increases or what happens as k minus x increases um, helps to sort of show that I've got a balancing loop here and a reinforcing loop here. And so um, I can go further with this and actually get rid of fish density entirely. And I can just implement this formula down here, this orange formula, in terms of potential fish, which is a stock that I'm now calling y and the current number of fish that I'm now calling X. And so the formula that I had here, this is just the good old fashioned logistic growth formula. I have now redrawn in terms of um, X and Y and this, um, and gotten rid of the explicit calculation of density because I can calculate density within the formula. And that way I don't need a lookup table or anything like that. I just, I just, this is a formula that depends only on X and Y. And in fact, these Ks, this carrying capacity can actually cancel out because this carrying capacity will end up sort of being inherited by whatever the current number of Y is and whatever the current number of X is. I know my carrying capacity is always X plus Y. So this is our modified diagram that helps us see so here, this orange formula is what happens inside the net regeneration curve, that I actually have a regeneration or a, a um, reinforcing loop 
which I can see as x increases, dx dt increases, and a balancing loop. As y increases, you can think of it that way, the denominator of this thing, decrease, or the denominator increases as y increases. So this whole formula shrinks as y increases. And so um, I've got a balancing loop here and a reinforcing loop here. Um, maybe I said that it, it a little different. I guess I could focus on the y that's up here. Actually, it is the, as the number of potential fish decrease, then the number of regeneration will also decrease. And so this um, balancing loop, because there is an implicit, I guess maybe I could draw that. So if I go back to my pointer, I can draw an implicit negative link here and an implicit positive link here. And so now I see that as x increases, so this is x here, I know that x plus y is, re is remaining constant. So as x increases, dx dt is going to increase. So x increases will ultimately have a positive effect on dx dt, and then that will have a positive effect on x, and that gives me my reinforcing loop. So this whole link loop here, or this whole link, is sort of super link is positive. So that's all positive there. And then if I look back at the other loop, then what I see here is as y, in, uh, let's say as y increases, then dx dt will also increase. But I see that as dx dt increases, that will decrease y. So from y going all the way around to dx dt, that is also a positive link. But then there's the negative link going back. And so that makes this a balancing loop and this a reinforcing loop. And we're just implementing the standard logistic growth formula that I've written in this form over here. And we're doing that inside this, this dot here. So this is an alternative way of writing our fishery so that we can see the balancing loop and the reinforcing loop. So now it's a little less of a mystery that we get S-shaped growth. So, um, with that in mind, just to see um, how uh, everyone is, um, is, is perceiving this, I've got this question down here that I would normally ask you in class, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the Zoom room here. Um, before we had a carrying capacity, which was like a separate parameter that you know, I'll call it K, that we could then, in, you know, inside VinSim or Insight Maker, we could change this, and it, was, and it got tied in to um, uh, the, the density variable, and that is how the carrying capacity would change the dynamics. Now we don't have carrying capacity anymore, um, at least it's not explicitly written. So if we wanted to change the carrying capacity in this model, what would we do? So what does the carrying capacity correspond to in this model? So does anybody have any ideas? I could also experiment with putting you into random breakout rooms um, of two people each, if, uh, if that seems like that's something people would like to do. So maybe we'll try that. I am going to, just to be adventurous, um, see if I can, For some reason, I'm not seeing my breakout room button. Um, so I may need to try this on a... Um... Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is just the bottom left one. So the question is, so if uh, before I had a carrying capacity parameter in the stock and flow diagram, so if you wanted to change the carrying capacity, you just change that parameter. Now we've gotten rid of that parameter. So all now I have these two stocks. And there's actually no parameters that I see draw going into this system. So there's no uh, maximum uh, fishery size that is being drawn into here. So if I wanted to say that, okay, like initially I simulated 100 fish. So I'm focusing, how do I implement carrying capacity? So initially I might have simulated 100 fish, but now I want to simulate 1,000 fish being possible in the fishery. Where do I put that 1,000? You would just change... You'd increase the value of potential fish stock? Uh, yeah, so, so basically that's exactly kind of what I'm looking for here. So I would, in, um, I would change the initial condition. So, um, so that's the, the next slide here. 
I change the initial conditions of these two stocks. And so you know that like inside VinSim and Insight Maker, you can drill down into the, um, the equation for your stocks and you can't change like, uh, there's no like formulas you put in there, but you put the initial conditions of these two things. And so you might initially say, I have one fish in my fish stock. So maybe I say that equals one, but then my potential fish stock, I might say uh, that I, I have 99 potential fish. And so if I start my simulation this way, then as the simulation goes, I'm going to convert potential fish into real fish, but the sum of the two fish is always going to add up to the maximum fishery size of 100. So if I wanted to change my maximum fishery size to 1000, then I just change my initial condition from 99 to say 999. And if I were to do that, that would change my maximum fishery size from 100 to 1000. And so that is how we implement a different carrying capacity in this new model. It's by changing the initial number of uh, the initial population demographics. So initially, if we view potential fish as a population, it's how many initial individuals do we have in that population changes the carrying capacity. Are there questions about that? that we've now engulfed, um, we've taken carrying capacity, which used to be a separate parameter, and we've spread it across the initial conditions in these two compartments. And if you remember the SIR model that we talked about in the last lecture, this should make a little bit of sense. It's like saying how many people are initially susceptible versus how many people are initially infected and how many people are initially recovered. The sum of all those initial conditions is the total population. Well, here, I'm saying how many initial spots do I have in my fishery, that's the, I, the uh, potential fish, and how many are already taking up those spots, that's the fish stock, and you add the two of them together, and that's the total number of fish you can have in the fishery. So questions about that? Does that seem clear how we've turned carrying capacity into initial conditions? So this used to be one parameter, and now it's effectively two parameters hidden, okay? Is that yes, there's a question? Or yes, that's understood? I see just a yes in the chat. It makes sense, good, okay, great. All right, so, if there are any, so moving forward then, um, we can draw, so I've just taken the, the, the stock and flow model from over here. Oh, I see, would this be the basis for a sustainable fish harvesting model trying to model maximum sustainable yield? So maximum sustainable yield is something that we will talk about later in the semester, um, not actually not that many lectures from here, um, but, and so yes, we are setting ourselves up for that. And that maximum sustainable yield stuff is, I'm gonna, if I were to hop back a little bit, um, I'm looking back to this slide. So this, that maximum sustainable yield stuff, again, we'll cover this in a couple of lectures, but that actually corresponds to the fish density or fish population which represents the point at which the net regeneration rate is highest. And so, um, and again, we'll talk about this in a couple of lectures, but um, in a model like this, we basically can ask, what is the most amount of fish we can harvest per year, for example? Let's say this is in per year units, that's net regeneration rate. And so if 500 fish are harvested per year, then we know that that's like the most amount of fish that the fish could regenerate themselves through natural processes. So if you start to harvest, say, 600 fish per year, then you know that the fish, there is just no density of fish that allows the fish to produce 600 fish per year. And so that's going to cause you to take your fish population and have it collapse over time. And so um, we'll get into all of that stuff again um, in a couple of lectures, but this is exactly the type of model where we can investigate maximum sustainable yield. So great question. All right, any other questions about this? All right. So we've taken this um, ugly model that I've kind of broken up here, and if I were to redraw it in a clean way, 
then we end up getting something that looks like this. So we've got a fish stock on the right, a remaining fish capacity on the left, and kind of a birth rate here with our balancing loop on the left in this um, on the right here. And I can imagine in VinSim creating these shadow variables, remaining fish capacity. This is just a copy of the stock that's above it. And fish stock, this is just a copy of the stock above it. And then I could create this little summing variable, carrying capacity. And this thing would always be constant if I plotted it. So it's kind of silly to, to do this, but, um, but I could potentially do this. And then that would allow me to have a variable that keeps track of my total carrying capacity. So the advantage of that is if I wanted formulas that were dependent on total carrying capacity, I could just route this dynamic variable carrying capacity into those formulas. And that way I don't have to do the math of adding up these two stocks separately. So the birth rate here, that is like this dx dt. And so inside this birth rate, we're implementing this formula that I see here. So this births per year, that's this uh, R that we see in the logistic growth formula. And this fish stock, that's the X that we see in the logistic growth formula. And then remaining fish capacity, that is the uh, Y. And then our uh, carrying capacity, that's just the sum of these two. And that's the X plus Y. So the same formula that we implement here is written out in the calculus form here. Now I'm hoping that when we um, look at this formula, it starts looking a little bit familiar from something that we've seen recently. So um, if you kind of stare at this and you say I've got two compartments and I see that there is a feedback from one compartment that is a positive feedback that so this is the, the positive feedback process that's going on here. This is our reinforcing loop. And then I've got this negative feedback process through this depletion loop where as I get more and more growth in fish stock, I get a depletion of the remaining fish capacity. I'm hoping that when you stare at that and squint enough, it starts looking very much like the SIR model or particularly the SI part of the SIR model from last week, or sorry, from, well, yeah, I guess last week, the last lecture, where our remaining fish capacity are kind of like a group of susceptibles. So it's like these phantom fish have not been infected by life yet. And the, um, these fish over here, you can view them as like infected fish where they've been infected by life. And the more infected fish you have, the more they infect these phantom fish, and then they end up getting uh, converted into real fish. And so that process of converting remaining fish capacity into fish stock looks a lot like the process of converting susceptibles into infected individuals. And so um, you can view down here, this DIDT, this was our infection rate is just like a birth rate. And so the births per year, births per fish per year, that's a little bit like the number of infections per infected individual. So that's um, these parameters that we see will pop up in the um, SIR model. And then um, this uh, spot over here, this is like the fraction of contacts with an infected person that are dangerous. And so we said that if we take a well-mixed approximation of the population where the population is not being quarantined, so if there's 20% susceptible, then every time you bump into someone, there's a 20% chance that they are a susceptible, then you can scale all of the interactions that an infected person has by the number of dangerous interactions or the fraction of dangerous interactions to find out the rate of new infections. And so what we're seeing here is that the SI part of the SIR model is exactly a population growth model, the same that we've been studying. So I can take this, you know, remember this, this is like the S and this is like the I, and I can look down at the SIR model from last time, and I end up seeing that the depletion and contagion loops are exactly like the balance. So here's this depletion loop down here. This is exactly like the balancing loop that we have up here. And this contagion loop is exactly like the reinforcing loop. The dynamics are identical. So we can think about um, 
population growth in terms of infections and vice versa. The infection rate in our SIR model is like a growth rate in the logistic population model. So, like, so whenever, now I, I've mentioned that we see logistic growth in a lot of different processes. So not just in fisheries, like we have up here, but also in the growth and eventual saturation of products in marketplaces. Like we saw that the cable, uh, you know, uh, so for that cable growth rate, we had initially some cable subscribers and then there was an increase in cable subscribers and then there was eventually a saturation in cable subscribers. And, um, and so this, uh, and so not surprisingly then we can kind of think about ways in which this infection loop this infection process this SI process might be able to be used to model these market processes as well and that was kind of the innovation that this individual named Bass had so although this looks a lot like a fisheries model and it has the name Bass it has nothing to do with Bass fish it's just the last name of the person that first advocated this as a model for how products grow in a marketplace, how products are adopted in a marketplace. And just like we had um, potential fish in our remaining fish capacity, then Bass said, well, what if we have a stock of potential adopters? And then we also, just like we have a stack of a uh, stock of actual fish, then we have a stock of actual adopters. So this is like you tried to, you just come up with an iPhone or you've come up with some new product and you have a certain number of people that have adopted that product and you have a certain number of additional people that could adopt that product. You know that it's not infinite because the market is finite. And so anyone in the market who has not adopted your product but could adopt your product is a potential adopter. And this is exactly the type of fish model that we just built in, the, in our sort of rethinking of the fisheries model. And so we see that these loops look identical. And so we, um, so this is a model of growth. And just like we had a carrying capacity in our fisheries, we have a maximum market size. And if you remember in the fisheries case, the carrying capacity was set in the model by the initial conditions in the remaining fish capacity plus the initial condition in the fish stock. Then similarly, the maximum market size, which is like the carrying capacity um, in this case is the initial condition of the potential adopters and the initial condition of the adopters. So if you would want to simulate, say, you know, the cable uh, curve, then you would say, how many people are in the cable market? Well, we say potentially we think um, that, uh, and I'll answer that question in a second. Um, you say, uh, potentially there are a million people in the cable market. So you say, well, I'm going to say that initially we have a thousand people um, as, our, as our initial set of adopters. And then we want to study the dynamics of growth when there's a thousand adopters. And we put the million minus 1,000, so we're going to do 1 million minus 1,000 in the potential adopters. And that is the way we, mar we, we end up modeling the maximum market size because it's the sum of these two initial conditions. So I'll say the maximum market size is the sum of the initial conditions. And I see uh, this question here, is this also largely affected by the contact rate? And the, um, so the, the, what we'll see is that the growth engine, if the growth engine is word of mouth, then the contact rate maps very nicely. And that's actually the next slide we're gonna get into here. And so yes, contact rate will play a, a major role here. And so you'll see that in this next slide. But um, before I do that, is it, um, well, maybe we'll just hop into that to make this analogy clearer, is that we're just, we, we're just sort of saying that we would like to model the diffusion of ideas through a marketplace or the diffusion of products through potential adopters. And we are modeling that like this population growth model, 
which you can also think of as being like um, the SIR model with an infection rate. So if I go to the next slide here, then this helps answer that question, is this uh, affected by the contact rate? We've got our potential adopters and our adopters, and the adoption process here, we're modeling as a word of mouth process. And so there is a positive feedback where adopters talk to potential adopters, and as the adopters talk to potential adopters, some of those potential adopters get converted into adopters. And so we have a total population here, which is just the sum, of our adopters plus potential adopters. And this um, contact rate, this is sort of how frequently and someone who has the device or who has adopted the idea bumps into other people uh, in the marketplace. And then the adoption fraction is going to then model uh, what fraction of those encounters will actually turn into new adoptions. And so these things all combine, so this is our potential adopters come into here, um, into the rate of turnover from potential adopters to adopters. So this uh, is a, re the word of mouth is like an infectious uh, reinforcing loop, but you end up running out of potential adopters over time. And so that ends up giving you this saturation loop. So you've got a balancing loop here and a reinforcing loop there. And the contact rate represents how quickly those with a, uh, who have already adopted can reach people who potentially could adopt, but how effective they are at converting them is tied up in this adoption fraction. So Will, does that answer your question about how this is affected by contact rate? Word uh, of mouth is greatly depends. Yeah. Great. So, um, so, so we're viewing now this uh, so I've got all the of the formulas here on the left-hand side here. And again, I hope you can kind of see the relationship to the SIR model here. And so we can further drive that home where we're saying the potential adopters are susceptible, the adopters are infectious, and the um, and then you can view them, this contact rate as the total number of contacts per day, the adoption fraction, how effective they are at turning over as an infectivity, and then our total population is just that kind of uh, total size of the marketplace. And so all of these, again, match exactly our intuition from the SIR model. And so not surprisingly, when you simulate this BAS model, you get things that look like what come out of the SIR model. Uh, so this adoption rate down here, this looks like our infectious disease or our infection curve. So we've got a peak infection here at some, uh, some time level. We've got our potential adopters. This is like our susceptibles. And then we've got our adopters, which are like our infected. Now, uh, in the case of disease, we would potentially like to keep the adoption rate or the number of infections down. So maybe I'll put I down here. We would like to reduce the number of adopters and make a very slow adoption rate. But in the case of markets where we're trying to get our product, or if you think in terms of sustainability, this is also how you market a sustainable practice like recycling. So it might be that I recycle, and if you learn that I recycle, maybe you'll recycle. Well, how do we amplify the ability of you to learn that your neighbors recycle? Well, we make the recycling bins green, and we make them big and conspicuous so that when you put them out on the corner, then people notice that other people are recycling. And so the more they notice, then the more infectious the idea is. There still might be, um, uh, that might increase your contact rate, but that might not increase your adoption fraction. And so, you know, maybe in order to increase your adoption fraction, you need to provide additional incentives, et cetera, et cetera. And so we want to increase the speed of adoption when it comes to markets, whereas in, when, when it comes to infections, we might want to decrease the speed of adoption. So it's the exact same dynamics, but our interventions will kind of be opposite to that. And so when we look at this, not from a disease perspective, but from a market adoption perspective, then we say that, wow, this is way too slow. It's, if it takes us six years 
for people to really start adopting our product, that is maybe not enough for us. We would much rather this curve start rising earlier than that. And so uh, the question is then how do we, um, it, so how do we increase the, the growth, the, at least the initial growth of the adoption? So um, this was sort of a question that we had on the, the, the reading assessment that was due before class. So how, how did they do it? So in any market adoption, you ultimately want to depend on word of mouth. But before word of mouth, what do you have to do to get people to start adopting your product? Anybody have good answers to that? Advertise. You advertise. Advertise. I hear it. Thank you. Yes, exactly. You advertise. So that's what we're shooting for here is that we need advertising. So you could say, well, what? Uh, if I'm considering the SIR model, what is a relationship to advertising? Um, advertising is like infecting the population. So this is like um, inoculating the population with a disease that didn't actually exist anymore. So in order to get some adopters here to start the word of mouth process, you need to kind of generate adopters out of nothing. And so, um, you know, in the case of a virus, you know, a new virus might pop into play. And then the question is, uh, how many initial people does it have to infect for those people to start infecting people? And in the case of a very infectious disease, you don't have to infect that many people for it to start spreading through a population. And that's bad in the case of infectious diseases. But if it's a really good idea, then the question will be, how many people do you need to advertise to? And maybe you don't need to advertise to that many people because if it's a really, really good idea, it only takes a few, they're gonna tell their friends, their friends will see that it works really well and then it will pick up and catch like a wildfire and so you end up not, not needing the advertising as much. But if it's not quite a great idea or if there's already alternatives out there, you might need to spend a lot of money on advertising to get out there. And so ultimately it's word of mouth that drives the longevity and sustainability of ideas. You need people to end up sort of self-advertising. But to start the process, you often need advertising. The same way diseases don't come out of nowhere, but somebody needs to be initially infected um, and they might be infected you know, from an animal or they might be infected from a spontaneous mutation inside them or from a surface. They may not be infected from another person, but then once you get people that are infected, then things can spread through a population. So that's what advertising is doing. It's the initial infection of an idea. And so if we look now at the curves when we've added advertising, so I guess maybe we could focus on this curve, this, I, that we added this loop here or this additional loop here that has advertising. And so we can see that the rest of this is exactly the BAS model or the kind of SI model and the SIR model. But now we've made it so that there is an advertising effectiveness that ends up so basically you spend a certain amount of money and that provides you advertising effectiveness. And then for every potential adopter, then combined with the amount of money that you're spending on advertising, there is a turnover rate and that turnover rate converts potential adopters into adopters without having experienced an existing adopter. So this uh, loop here, that we've got here uh, that's going by way of advertising is converting potential adopters to adopters without contact of adopters. But you end up getting a dilution of that effect. And so this is ultimately a balancing loop. And that is just because, again, you run out of potential adopters. So it's the same reason why you market saturation is a balancing loop because you run out of potential adopters. So as you spend a lot of money, initially you get a bunch of people adopting your idea, but after a while, no matter how much money you spend in putting new advertisements on TV, if everybody watching TV is already using your product, then you get a dilution effect. And so that's what we're, what's being seen right here. So by adding this little loop in here, which basically is just gonna multiply the potential adopters by the advertising effectiveness, and that's going to create a background rate of conversion from potential adopters to adopters. Then if we regenerate those curves, we get 
these curves that look like this one, which the shape looks identical to the previous one, but if you look, it rises much faster. So instead of being six years, it's only like two and a half years. And so now that, um, and then so you can see the infectious peak here, the peak infectivity or the peak adoptions happen much earlier. And so you reach saturation, you still reach saturation, but you reach that saturation. In this case, you reach saturation basically before things started taking off without advertising. So, um, so that's how we kind of compare um, these curves together is that by investing a little bit in getting our idea out there, then that starts this process sooner. But then ultimately, the effectiveness of our advertising is going to taper off. And we might even not need to advertise anymore as the population's adopters will end up continuing to spread this. So really, if you think about it, the back half of this curve looks identical to the word of mouth curve. So really, as long as we get up to this like back half here, then we can allow word of mouth to take over and we can sort of turn off advertising. So advertising starts things soon. So this is the age of advertising here. And then after uh, a certain point, then word of mouth kind of picks up and takes off after that. So similar dynamics, but our adoption rate starts much sooner. So there are questions on our, well, the way we're modeling the adoption of an idea, like an SI portion of an SIR model, where we are modeling both the word of mouth process, which is like, a infectious disease process and the advertising process, which is kind of almost like someone going through and injecting people with the idea and then allowing the idea to spread naturally once you get enough people injected with it. All right. All right, so, um, so to move forward, then what we're gonna do is take this basic idea and then try to then customize it to systems that we're interested in. And so I'm bringing this up because as you're doing your final projects, you might think that in your final projects, you've got something that looks like a growth model. Like you do want a model, let's say for example, you're interested in doing that recycling example that I just talked about there. And you could say, well, basically the recycling is like this bass model, but it's got certain aspects of it that we need to add into it. So it's got special parts of the dynamics that we would like to investigate. And so, what you can do is you can take a bass model, which basically the bottom half of this thing is a bass model, and then you can add things that are specialized to your system. So in this particular case, um, I'm modeling repeat purchases. So an example of this is baking soda. So baking soda is a brilliant product. And this is a brilliant product because people have convinced people to buy this product and immediately dump it down their sink. So it's rare that you find a product that you, you, that it was originally meant for something else. So keep in mind, baking soda was originally for baking and a box of baking soda might last some people a huge amount of time. And so they figured out a way to market baking soda for cleaning. And you could dump an entire box of baking soda down um, during one cleaning event and then have to go out and immediately buy baking soda. And so, um, or you could take baking soda, instead of using it for baking, you could stick it in your refrigerator. And, um, and then if you needed it for baking, then you would have to go out and buy new baking soda. So the question is, um, how does this idea of repeat purchases affect the dynamics of adoptions? And maybe in this case, it isn't going to affect how many people adopt, but how does it affect our sales rate? So we've taken the standard BAS model. So that's what's down here. And in order to model the repeat purchases, we've added on to the top of it, this, section, this um, coordinating network here, which takes the number of current adopters and it ends up um, helping us better calculate a sort of sales rate um, keeping in mind that some of those adopters will be repeat adopters. And so we have kind of an initial purchase rate. So this is like, you know, you initially got people hooked. So you had some over here in under potential adopters, these people were not using baking soda. <clears throat> over here, these people have bought baking soda once, at least once. And so what we want to do is 
to, to show our stakeholders who are interested in this, we don't wanna just model how many times people have bought baking soda once. We wanna model the effect of some of those people continuing to buy baking soda over and over and over again. And so for each one of these people, we say how many of those people end up buying baking soda over and over and over again. And then that ends up contributing to repeat sales. So you could imagine a formula up here which combines the initial sales, which is so, you know, from the initial conversion, how much money do you get by converting a potential adopter? And then this, say 50% of those go out and keep buying baking soda. Then for that 50%, then you can model repeat sales. And then if you were to plot this, this thing that's up here, then that would give your stakeholders a better idea of how much revenue you were getting. And so um, there's a question here, would this be similar to an SIRS model? That's an excellent question. We will sh I will show you the, the relationship between a BAS model and an SIRS model in a couple of slides. Um, and so an SIRS model would be when you have adopters that eventually come back and become potential adopters again. And so here we're saying that they are permanently in infected um, but, and so they're not becoming recovered again. So what do I mean by being becoming recovered? So let's say um, there's an alternative to baking soda for cleaning your sink. So if you can manage to get people on the baking soda train, then they will just keep buying baking soda every time they want to clean their sink. But if um, you're worried that some of them are going to give up on baking soda and start buying some other cleaning product, then that's kind of them going back to becoming susceptible again. And that means you're going to need to win them over again. You're going to need to reinfect them. And so the SIRS product, um, uh, pattern is just like having somebody who got infected with a disease, and then they end up going back to becoming susceptible to disease, which in the case of the market becomes susceptible to not only to your disease, your idea, but other people's ideas too. So we'll get into that. And in fact, I think that might be one of the next slides. Um, can the production and sales of bottled water fit into the SIR model? With the marketing of bottled water uh, is better, do we have to add an alternative in the model for the balance effect in the CLD? Um, so that's a good question. So bottled water, so you could say that there, um, that you have people, you want to model how many people buy bottled water in general, given that they could also do something alternative to that. And if you want to model people as once they buy bottled water, they only bottle buy bottled water, then that would fit very well into exactly what you've got here, potential adopters and adopters. And you might want to encourage them to buying other products. And so that turns them back into potential adopters. And so um, if we were to draw a flow, which again, we'll get into this in another slide here. If we were to draw a flow rate going backwards from adopters to potential adopters, you might be interested in what are the factors that can increase that flow or more particularly, um, how much of the backward flow do I need to accomplish my sustainability challenge? So if it's a sustainability problem that people are buying a bunch of bottled water, you know you can't get rid of people totally buying bottled water, but maybe you can reduce the amount of bottled water rate. And so you could then study how many, how much of a backward flow do I need to bring that down? And so we'll kind of get into that here in a second, I think in about two slides. Uh, but then the question, do we have to add an alternative to the model? Um, if you want to specifically, like, I think it'd be a really cool idea to say, like, having an adopter's stock that is adopting your product and an adopter's stock that adopts a different product. And then showing that when you're tied up in one product, you can't be tied up in the other product and there might be going back and forth. And, um, and we actually will see that um, in some of the future examples here talking about um, airlines and shifting from low cost airlines to, um, to uh, other carriers and so on and so forth. And then I see what a regulation variable cause that backflow. Yeah, I mean, you can think of the backflow, um, you could implement it as a, a regulation variable. Um, you could say that that would be one potential mechanism. I guess you probably mean like, um, like a law that's passed. And you could say like, what penalties do we need? Or 
um, what's the maximum amount of bottled water per person for people to decide that bottled water isn't worth it for their household. Um, that would be something that sure you can model is part of this so-called backflow. All right, well, let's, let's get into that. So let's um, just for uh, to try to give some other ideas here, let's say, well, what if we wanna model durable items? Now a durable item is something like a, um, a refrigerator. It's called durable because it is a piece of equipment that you buy and you keep for a long amount of time and you will eventually discard it and need to buy a new one, but, uh, but that may be far, far in advance of the development of other products. And so you can imagine that between the time you buy a refrigerator and need a new refrigerator, there could be four or five different generations of new refrigerators that come out. And so, um, and so that means that you can't count on just because you turn out a new refrigerator that someone's gonna buy it because they might be stuck with their old refrigerator for 15 years, for example. And so this is getting closer to like the last couple of questions. So I've got potential adopters and I've got adopters and I've got a flow going back from adopters to potential adopters, but only after a certain average product life. And so this average product life might be very long. And so we've got our BAS model that's down here, the standard BAS model. And, um, and what we've now just added is a reverse flow going from adopters back to potential adopters after a product. Uh, period here. Otherwise, everything is identical. And so now we could experiment with um, what happens to the population dynamics as we make the product life longer or shorter. So, um, an like for example, if I was advising a group that would wanted to do something like this, I might say, um, how does average product life, let's say I can actually connect this to something like um, the adoption fraction. So if the product uh, lasts for a very long amount of time, then it's possible that people will be more willing to buy it when they find out that their neighbors have it. But the longer that product lives, then through this other link, then, then I get fewer people discarding the product. And so with fewer people discarding products, then I get fewer people available to buy new products. So when I'm trying to come up with how to engineer my product lifetime, it might actually be in my benefit to build products that don't last forever. Because if I have a really dominant product, I don't want to end up um, basically reaching market saturation and then never getting any revenue stream uh, because that market keeps that product for the next 15 years before buying a new product. And so maybe I actually want to, to, to engineer in a five-year lifespan. Now, I, if I engineer a one-year lifespan, then maybe that's so short that people aren't ever gonna wanna adopt my product. So that would be kind of an interesting dynamic to play with if you're modeling the adoption of durable items. And so how would we implement that? Uh, you could go into this discard rate flow and maybe you would implement this as like adopters divided by average product life. And so you can kind of think of that as every adopter keeps the product for, an at what for this average product life. And so you can kind of think of the, this is like a death rate. And so for every adopter in this box, they die and become a potential adopter again at an individual rate of one over average product life. And so if you wanna measure the total flow rate back through this, then it's just the number of adopters times one divided by the average product life, which is just adopters divided by average product life. Okay. And that's just what I'm saying here. Okay. So, um, so if you think about this in terms of epidemics, then, um, then this is, it, it kind of gets to that question that we had earlier, is that this looks a lot like an SIS model, where you have a group uh, so I think Brandy's question from earlier, you have a group um, that are susceptible, they then become infected, and then after they become infected, they stay infected for a certain time, 
And then after um, that certain amount of time on average, they then recover and they become susceptible again. And so they can become reinfected. And so in an SIS model, if we look at the behavior over time for an SIS model, then what we find is that after some transient period, so you've got your initial infections here, then you get a stable population of infected individuals or infectious individuals up here and a stable population of susceptible individuals down here. And so now continuing throughout time, then you're going to have, um, it's always gonna be the case that say 10% 10 10 of your population is susceptible and 90% of your population is infectious. They're constantly exchanging. So you're constantly having people recovering and becoming susceptible and susceptible people becoming infected. But this is kind of the average in the demographics. Similarly, in terms of the product adoption, then what we end up having is um, like 10% are constantly looking for a refrigerator and 90% constantly have a refrigerator. So um, hopefully that helps um, with, um, with your question too, Brandy. All right. And so that's all that I'm just kind of saying here. So any questions about those modifications to this BAS model? All right, so the other tip I wanna say in this is this, um, how to use these models to rehearse scenarios and strategies. And that could have comes up to this EasyJet example. And so this was an example I talked about in the book where EasyJet, you can think of this as a budget airline and they um, invested $500 million in 1997. And it was a real gamble uh, because the, idea was that they said, well, we need low cost air travel, but in order to do that, we need to buy a, a bunch of new airplanes and we, but we need it to fill those planes quick enough with 1 million passengers so that we can recoup this giant $500 million uh, contract. So, um, the, uh, so then the question is, are we going to be able to do that? And how can we imagine threats to this particular idea here. So we need to form a dynamic hypothesis that we can do in our modeling. And so how do we model the growth? Well, whenever you see growth now, you should start modeling it as if it's a fisheries model. So we're gonna do, um, we've got like our stock of fish. So those are our potential passengers and we've got our fish growth rate, increase in potential passengers. We've got marketing effectiveness. So this is how you know, uh, we're going to inoculate these passengers. We're going to say we're going to spend a bunch of money to get an initial group of passengers to try out our aircraft. And then the question is, is that going to be enough for us to reach 1 million passengers? And it turns out that um, if, we, if we simulate that, if we think about it, where well, we've got, um, you know, so let's just say, we get, uh, we've invested, this is 50 passengers uh, per thousand pounds spent, and we've invested um, this many thousand pounds per year. So that's a lot of money, like 2.5 million pounds per year. And, um, and so that's gonna give us 125,000 new passengers per year. Now, if you think about that, in order for us to reach, reach 1 million, that's going to be almost 10 years. And so that's going to be us spending every year, spending this 2.5 million pounds in order to bring us up to those 1 million passengers. So basically, advertising alone is not enough for us to guarantee that we can fill those seats because it'll end up being uh, like it, we end up we only spent whatever 500 million on the planes themselves. And so now we're spending, you know, half of that just on advertising. So then how do we recoup all that advertising money? So we really need a word of mouth. So the question is, um, can we provide good enough service so that the potential passengers will end up recruiting new passengers so that we only need to do a little bit of advertising and then those new passengers will tell their friends and then those friends will become new passengers. So marketing is a starter mo motor and word of mouth is the growth engine. 
And so um, we can build a model of this, and this model ends up looking a lot like, um, you know, it looks a lot like the bass model, it looks a lot like the fisheries model. Um, we have this thing called a conversion ratio, which basically allows us to turn our fare. So this is how much we're charging the, this is how cheap our ticket is relative to the rest of the tickets in the industry. And this conversion ratio, this is how many people we can convert um, into our product from the other product. So this might be good for that bottled water case uh, as well. And so this conversion ratio, we basically have plotted the relative fare on this axis. And so this relative fare here, you can see it scales from zero where this is basically free flights and 1.2. And this 1.2 means that our ticket is 20% more expensive than the market price. And, um, and so we see that if we go to a free price, we're gonna model this in a lookup table as having a um, conversion ratio of three, which basically means for every individual that, um, that flies, then, um, then maybe that, um, I think in the conversion ratio case, this basically means we get a three time multiplier on the increase in potential passengers. So whatever the background rate of potential passengers is, we can multiply that by three um, if we have free flights. Now, of course we can't have free flights. So the question is how cheap do we have to make our flights to keep our conversion ratio high so that it's high enough for us to grow our potential passengers in order for us to recoup our investment in, uh, in all of these planes. Now the problem is we also have to model that our rival's response because they're not gonna sit still as we introduce these cheap flights. They are going to change their fares and as they make their fares cheaper, then that will uh, change our relative fares so that our fares might have looked cheap initially, but will end up looking similar to our rival fares as the rival fares get cheaper themselves. And so we want to then model how quickly our rivals can change their fares. And so our rival fares, they change over time. So that implies that our rival fare should probably be a stock. Um, and, um, and let me, I'm going to hold off on your question right now, Jordan, and I will get back to you just right after to the specific of the bottled water. I just want to make sure we get through the, the chapter content here, but I, I see it. Um, and then, uh, so we want to model our rival fares as an additional stock that changes over time. And we need to model then how quickly our rivals are able to change their fare. And so we need to model what determines their timing. So we are going to build a stock rival fare. This is what their fare is. And we have our change, which is the flow going into that rival fare. And we imagine our rivals are gonna restructure. So they're gonna retrain their employees. They're gonna restructure their planes. They're gonna do a bunch of things that take time. And so the time that it takes is a time constant in this that you see here. So basically what you've ended up modeled here is a kind of delay in which um, the, um, the startup, so our EasyJet example is like an input into the, so this is like the water level into the toilet or the target water level into the toilet. And this is the actual water level that, um, so this rival fare is like the actual water level and it takes time for our rivals to start moving toward the fare that we set. And the time constant that allows them to change it is going to be set by here. So we end up um, then wiring in that rival fare into our relative fare and that closes our loop. So this change in rival fare is just going to be like the, um, f our fare minus the fare set by the startup divided by the time to change costs. That's what goes into this thing here. And then their rival fare is gonna go into the relative fare and that will just be the fare set by the startup divided by the rival fare. And so as the rival fare gets cheaper, the relative fare will end up getting um, higher and higher. So we put all of that together here. So this is the formulas putting all of that together. And we can see, like I was saying here, that this whole section down here can actually be simplified by using a smoothing delay. And so um, 
we can end up putting the fare set by startup going in, the time to change costs going in, and implement this with a smoothing delay. And so that is another way to do that. So that's what we've, if you were to implement that as a single smoothing delay, you'd end up doing that here. I'm going through a little quickly here um, just to explain where some of the formulas in the book come from. And so that's what they've implemented as a smoothing delay for that. So we wire that thing in. And then are there other things that we're missing? You can add those things in. So I'm gonna go through, just, I'm just gonna mention them quickly that you can add in things like service reputation and that affects the number of churns. So basically the people that start on our service, on our low cost service, they're not gonna stay adopted. They may end up going back to other, other uh, options. And if um, our service reputation gets poorer, then we're gonna increase the rate of this churn. So we can add all of that stuff up together and you get into this complex set of loops here. And we're at time, so I just wanna show you this complex set of loops which um, basically has the BAS model with a bunch of stuff bolted onto it. So again, you start with the basic model and you make it your own. And, um, and that is kind of all that we're saying here. Start with a dynamic hypothesis, which is, um, you know, you can even sort of view that as the, ba the, the BAS model. And as you formulate, you can add these um, complexities and make it your own. As you test these things, then you end up finding whether your formulations are good you can then evaluate how well your model works and then you can go back and refit your models. And so as you're playing with these things, you can implement sliders in order to sort of see how you can change these parameters and how it affects things. And, um, and that's um, an example that normally I would go through this, but took a little extra time, but they go through this example in the book where they adjust the, the amount of spending and basically show that there is a critical amount that once you start spending enough, then you end up being able to beat the rivals, you end up being able to take enough market share before your rivals can kick in. But if you don't spend enough on your advertising, then your low cost airfare is not gonna be able to keep up with the rivals. The rivals will end up adjusting their fares and they will remain in the market. And that's just what we're showing here. The difference between an aggressive marketing strategy and a cautious marketing strategy um, under different cases of retaliation by your rivals. All right, so with that, um, that is, uh, I can take any questions after class here or during office hours. I just wanna remind you of um, that we do have this uh, assignment E2, which is your practice on units, sliders, and lookup tables and delays. So that was the one we assigned last week. So that's due on Sunday. Um, and then, you know, look out for these reading ass assessments and exercises, which are available on Canvas. And I'm making these reading assessments available ahead of time as quickly as I can. There's already one or two of them available, and then all of these are already available. And then, uh, so chapter eight is gonna be due before um, F1, and you can stop reading at page 293. So that's just a, a tip there. So with that, um, I can take any questions. The attendance exercise I'll ask for today um, is, uh, why is it called a BAS model? So we, we talked about how the BAS model happens to model, it it's, seems to be closely related to a fisheries model. So why is the name BAS used and is it related to the fishery? And as you all look at that, then I'm happy to take any questions for anyone willing to hang around. Um, I'll hang around in this room until 4.30. And then I will shift to my office hours room, which if you go to the Canvas webpage, it's on the front, it shows my office hour room. So um, are there any questions that anybody wants to bring up now? If you don't have any questions, you can feel free to pop off here and I will stop the recording um, as, things, as questions get more individualized and less uh, interesting to the group. The only question I had was the one I put in the chat. I don't know if you answered that or not. Already? Gotcha. So that's the, the water model here. Well, then I will. Um, does anybody else have any other questions that re relate more generally before I get into Jordan's question, which is about something I think that's more specific to their modeling challenge? All right. In that case, I'm going to uh, just stop the recording. <laughs>